Brazen altar. That's where we're going to be at tonight. Exodus chapter 27. We're going to flip over there and we'll start looking at the text. Exodus chapter 27, starting with verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. Thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt <coughs> make for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with board shalt thou make it, as it was shewed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Get in verse 1. Thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood. First of all, I want you to notice that it's an altar. Let me get you a better picture here of this. This brazen altar comes in two parts. There's the grate, and it's just basically a box open up and on the top and bottom and having a uh, covering on just four sides, five cubits by five cubits and three cubits high. The grate set down inside of it. I have a picture here, I believe, with the grate in it. There you go. And the grate was one and a half cubits up, was in the center or the midst of the brazen altar. The brazen altar is referred to by different names in different places throughout the Old Testament. It's called the altar of shittim wood, the altar of burnt offering, the brazen altar, the altar of God, or just the altar. Malachi chapter 1 verse 7 and 12 called the table of the Lord. It's also called the altar of the door of the tabernacle in Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 5. The word altar has primarily two meanings in the Greek. It carries the meaning of lifted up and slaughter place. Now, just by definition, an altar, a uh, place of sacrifice, and by the very meaning of, its, of the word altar, lifted up, we know that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15, and John chapter 12, 32, 33, among other scriptures, say that he was lifted up. The cross was the place of his death. Slaughter place, that's where the, of course, the lamb was slain. Jesus was slain. So those things in themselves point just to the fact that it's an altar, point to the fact that we're talking about the cross in conjunction with the brazen altar. Now, if you would, well, I'll just cover this real quickly here. Jesus was placed on an altar, his brazen altar, at the cross. In the Bible, Jesus tells us to do basically three things, among other things. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, number one. Number two, take up his cross. Number three, follow me. Mark 8, 34 says basically the same thing. He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Luke said it just a little bit differently. And, I, and the difference is what I want to key on in, this, in relationship here. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 25 says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, 
let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And I want to key on the, the, the daily part of that scripture. Luke 9, verse 23, deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31 uh, says, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. So what we're talking about, and, and of course in the tabernacle of Moses, they had the daily sacrifice. And uh, the brazen altar is not something you just go to and forget about it when you go into the brazen labor and, and progressing through the tabernacle of Moses or in the uh, footsteps or example of Jesus. You've got to always keep the brazen altar in context. And it's a daily deal. Now, you remember the scripture in Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose you this day who you will serve. I was meditating on that, whether well, this context here of a, the daily sacrifice. And, uh, and Joshua said, Choose you this day who you will serve. He didn't say, Choose you from now on who you will serve. And it brought back a uh, Sunday school teacher we had. Mr. Alcorn, who, and I've shared this with you before, who, uh, and this just, just remains with me, that, uh, I don't know how old we were, 12, 13, 14, around there, and there was about 30 of us in Sunday school that morning, and he asked us how many of us could go a year without sinning, nobody raised their hand a month, nobody raised their hand a week, nobody raised their hand a day, nobody raised their hand and he got down to a minute, and everybody raised their hand, and he said, well, then that's how you got to live it, a minute at a time. And really, that's what Jesus is telling us here. It's today. Don't even worry about tomorrow. Matthew chapter 6, he told us that. He said, don't even take no thought about tomorrow. When you get up in the morning, just today, I'm going to serve God. Today, I'm not going to sin. Today, I'm going to deny myself. Today, I'm going to take up my cross and follow him. Just do it today. That's all you got to do. Just do it today. That's right. Just like the song says. Just one day at a time. And that's what and if you will break it down into that one day increment and just do it today, then the more you get up and say, I'm not gonna worry about tomorrow, I'm just gonna do it today. You can do it. And that's the way he admonishes you here. Daily, daily, daily. Quit thinking about tomorrow, next week, next year, you know, thinking about Lord, I'm gonna know I'm gonna mess up here next month, you know, or next week or tomorrow. But don't worry about tomorrow. Choose you this day who you'll serve. And do that every morning. Who are you going to serve today? But it's a daily daily thing, a daily event, a daily sacrifice, a daily taking up the cross. A daily a choice. And Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, Now is the day of salvation. It's a daily thing. 1 John 3.16, he talks about laying down our life for the brethren. And no greater love has anyone than to lay down their life for their friend, John 15.13. And that's the laying down you do. You know, and it can be in different ways. I know uh, every day you do that, Sandy does, for other people. Uh, all of you do in some, to some extent or another. But it's a daily deal. And I just want to emphasize daily because that's what the Lord's been stressing to me through these scriptures was... Daily, daily, daily. Quit thinking about tomorrow and just do it one day at a time. The uh, word altar also means, like I said, lifted up, and Jesus was lifted up on a cross. Uh, after, of course, after the cross, he was also lifted up in that he ascended on high. And uh, he was our sacrifice on the tree. And I want to look at a few... Uh, a few scriptures here I want us to turn to because I want to kind of stress this brazen altar a little with some scriptures from the New Testament. First Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. And we're just going to read some scriptures. 1 Peter 2.24. If you don't remember anything else, remember that the gate and the outer court, nothing else, it's the way. And there's no other way but him. Remember, there was a hanging on the gate, and he was the one hung. 
He's the way. First thing you see when you walk through that gate is a brazen altar. And you remember how I showed you the, the slide or uh, template there where it had the tabernacle and the camp in the form of a cross? If you go down to the bottom of the cross, at the feet you're going to find the brazen altar. And that's where you start at. And we talked about the eastern gate last time. And the star in the east. First Peter 2.24 who his own self, I'm talking about Jesus, bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Bear our sins in his body on the tree, the sacrifice. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9.26 Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, the brazen altar was a place of sacrifice. That's where they made all the five Levitical offerings, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the meal offering, the trespass offering, the sin offering that you'll find in Leviticus chapter 1 through 7. All of them were made right here at this brazen altar, place of sacrifice. He was the sacrifice, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He bare our sins in his own body on the tree. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Just flip over a couple pages from where you're at. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Now flip over to Romans chapter 6. See, really, every sin you've ever committed, every sin you might ever commit, is already covered. Romans chapter 6. Verse 17, Romans six seventeen through 18. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You were the servants of sin, now you're free from sin. You're free from sin. Drop on down there, verse 22 through 23. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end to everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 18 there, which is chapter 6 of Romans, made free from sin. Verse 22, now being made free from sin. Flip on over a couple pages, Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now flip on over Romans chapter 12. A few more pages over. Romans 12, 1 puts it into perspective, I think, for us. And, and you remember I've, I've talked and I mentioned before about carrying this message balanced, what he did for us and then what we're supposed to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And again, I'm keying on sacrifice here. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
And I just want to key on verse 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now we're going to what, from what he did, which he made us free from sin, to what we're to do. This sacrifice, the body. Romans chapter 6, but backwards a little bit there. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Now, you start really thinking about what, I, what we're reading here. These are some really stout statements. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Romans 12, 1 said, Present your body as a living sacrifice. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Remember, grace 5 ties all through this thing. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 8, flip over a couple chapters. Verse 12, Romans 8, 12 through 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, which means put to death, the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you remember, I've said this many times, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses, and the word witnesses there is the Greek word martis, which means a martyr. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs, okay? Which is a voluntary laying down of your life, a martyr is. And uh, by the Holy Spirit, you're given the ability or enabling or power or dunamis to do that. And uh, here he's giving you the application of that power, the ability to be a martyr. And I'm not talking about natural death, going here and put a gun to your head or anything. Uh, we're talking about letting sin reign in your mortal body. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1. Colossians 3, 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Mortify, or put to death, Therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence I can't even pronounce that word, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I just want to key on verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now, first I went through Jesus' sacrifice. First Peter 2.24, his own self bare sins in his body on the tree. Hebrews 9.26, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10.12, he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Which, as a result of that, Romans 6.17 says, We're no more servants of sin. 6.18, we're made free from sin. Romans 6.22, now being made free from sin. Romans 8.2, made me free from the law of sin. And then we went through the scriptures on what our sacrifice is, our body. Romans 12.1, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Romans 6.12. Romans 8. 13, mortify the deeds of the body. Colossians 3, 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What is he saying is take control of yourself. Present your body a living sacrifice. Temple of the Holy Spirit. Another form of sacrifice. 
Philippians 4.18. couple scriptures in Philippians. And there in Colossians, we went over mortified, therefore you members which are upon the earth. He went over some of the things that he was talking about mortifying, putting to death, the uncleanness and blasphemy, filthy communication, and so forth. Philippians 4.18, another form of sacrifice. But I have all and abound and am full, having received uh, Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Things which were sent from you, a sacrifice. Things which were sent from they were supporting the apostles here. Philippians 2.17, back up a couple pages. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. I think I just wanted to key on here, one form of sacrifice is when you're supporting the ministries. That's a form of sacrifice. Give your body, give your money. Hebrews 13 and 15. These are just some sacrifices we make. Because remember, he's a sacrifice and we're a sacrifice. Hebrews 13 and 15. Hebrews 13, 15 says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Jeremiah 33, 11. I'll just read this one to you. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the lands as at the first, saith the Lord. Both those scriptures talk about one form of sacrifice being praise. What is praise? Uh, when we talk about praise, thanksgiving, and worship. And praise is, is really the uh, admiring him, adoring him. I'd be like me saying, Tell my wife, boy, you're beautiful. I love your hair. It looks good. Your eyes are pretty. You know, that's praise. Uh, you know, God, you're great. You know, you're merciful. You're gracious. Uh, you know, then there's Thanksgiving. Psalms 107, verses 21 to 22. Well, we'll just go to 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of Thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Psalms 116 and verse 17 says, I will offer thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Again, here we have thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is when he's done something for you. You know, thank you for not letting me be in that wreck I just saw. You know, whatever. Thanksgiving. And praise is just for who he is. Those are some forms of sacrifice that we do. Uh, and remember, it's got two staves. You've got to carry it balanced. There's what he did for us and what we must do. And really, all of this is to him and to our fellow man. Praise, thanksgiving, those things are to him. Uh, the laying down of your life for the brethren, uh, taking up your cross, following him, is for, the, obviously, each other, which, when you're doing it for each other, you're doing it for him anyway. Because if you didn't, he said, if you've done it unto the, one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So, you're still doing it for him. So do good. Uh, 27 wood. Uh, Shittim wood. Um, trees represent people. They represent man. And the reason I say that, and I'll just give you the, the scripture uh, references here and quote a little bit from them. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1 through 4 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He shall be like a tree. Jeremiah 
Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. All, all these are showing you men as trees. Isaiah 61, 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Mark chapter 8, verse 24. You remember the guy that had, was blind, and the Lord, uh, I believe he put mud in his eyes to heal him. And, and he, he says in eight, Mark 8, 24, and he looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. And then uh, Jesus told him to look up, and then he saw clearly and uh, I've reflected on that a little bit you know and, and uh, I always thought can't believe Jesus had to do something twice you know pray for a man twice to get him healed and then I got thinking uh, actually he got spiritual vision before he got natural vision because all men is trees first that was a spiritual revelation because men are trees spiritually speaking and then he got natural vision so all men is men so he opened up both eyes on that guy. Revelation ch chapter 11 talks about the two witnesses being the two olive trees. Again, trees indicative of men. Uh, and the altar was made of shittim wood overlaid with uh, brass. And shittim wood, as I mentioned to you previously, uh, comes from the acacia tree. And it is used in several pieces of furniture in the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of shoe bread, the altar of incense, the boards, the pillars. Uh, and, of course, the brazen altar. Uh, it speaks of Christ's incorruptible humanity, his sinlessness. Uh, wood also points again to the cross, and the cross is in everything. It goes all the way from the first piece to the last piece of furniture. It's got wood. It talks about the stem and the branch, you know, the branch man in Isaiah. Uh, interesting thing, I looked up this acacia wood in the dictionary, uh, actually, a Bible dictionary, and uh, talked about it was a, a tree, and I shared some of this last time, that had bark and had thorns on it and drew, grew out in the desert there. And uh, you remember, the very beginning, the purpose of the tabernacle was so that God could dwell among his people. That's the purpose. And if you're a part of the tabernacle, which all these things point to, not only Jesus, but us as part of, a part of uh, that which he dwells in, uh, part of that was wood. Wood also speaks of humanity, your human nature. And some interesting things here is, you know, to be used in the construction of the brass altar, brazen altar, or any of the other pieces of furniture throughout the tabernacle, you had, they had to go out to the desert, sever the tree from the ground, so it was severed from wherever it was uh, growing at, to be used, and uh, that reminded me of Colossians 1.13 where it says, you know, Jesus delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, so there's a removal from one place to another in the new birth. 2 Corinthians 6.14 tells us, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, so there's a separation there from that which is out, outside from that which is inside. The thorns were removed from it, from this tree, this acacia tree. And Mark chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, you remember the thorns of cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things were on the tree, and they had to be all severed off. All thorns had to be removed. You remember the crown of thorns. But those are the things that uh, make you that grow up and choke out the word, choke him out in the parable of the sower, or the cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. And he can't use you in the, the tabernacle, his presence can't dwell, you in, dwell in you in the fullness with those things choking him out. So that's the first thing that's got to be removed before you can be used. Uh, of course, the tree had bark on it, and I talked about that being the rough edges. Proverbs chapter 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. It also brings me 
uh, to remembrance uh, First Samuel of chapter 17, you remember David took five smooth stones from the brook to kill Goliath. And stones, as you've heard here on numerous occasions, get smoothed out because they're sitting in a brook, and as the water or the word flows over them, they roll around on the bottom of the brook and bump into each other and knocks off the, ro- off the ro- rough edges off of them so that they can be used by David or Jesus to kill giants or, you know, the things that Satan produces. So the rough edges got to come off. And you do that by flowing with the word and bumping up against each other. Then after that, the thorns are removed and the bark's removed. Then it's placed in the hands of craftsmen. And remember we went over that, how that the uh, Spirit of God came to these people and gave them wisdom and understanding knowledge and certain ones on how to do woodwork, some of them on how to do the metal work and different things and uh, weaving and things of that nature. So once the tree was severed from its original soil and the thorns and all removed and the bark's all removed, then it's given to a craftsman who then molds and shapes it and cuts it so that it can be used in the tabernacle. And what this speaks of is us, again, submitting to the ministries of Ephesians 4.11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers who under the guidance of God's spirits form us into something that is fit for the master's use as 2 Timothy 2.21 talks about. And it's through submission to these ministries. 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 5 and verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. And as you submit to these ministries, of course, your mind's renewed. Romans 12, 2, so that you know the good, perfect, acceptable will of God. You know what His will is, and you can prove that will by putting it in application. Also, 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 18, talk, talks about uh, that your, your mind will no longer be blinded and you're changed in His image from glory to glory. All this comes through submitting to God's ministry, or His hand, five-fold ministry. Exodus 27, 1 says, uh, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad. So the number five, again, we've talked about it being grace, and that God's act, God comes from the most. Five also speaks of the crucified life. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the reason I say it speaks of the crucified life is because when he was on the cross, there was one on this hand, one on this hand, one on each foot, and pierced side. So there's five wounds on the cross. And actually, to be one of the five ministries, you need to be crucified to properly manifest that ministry and, and, and to minister properly crucified life and again when does that happen daily daily and I, I've gone through numerous examples of five every night we've been here I think on all the dimensions of the tabernacle remember this is five cubits wide five cubits long it's a box five three cubits high that speaks of the among other things, of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who were involved in the three days and three nights of the atonement. Father gave the sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice. Holy Ghost reveals the sacrifice. Three. Then in verse Exodus 27, 1, it says, The altar shall be four square. And what that means, it's a square. It means it's the length and the width are the same. Five, 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 all the way around. Four square. A lot of other things four square in a tabernacle. The altar of incense is four square. The veil is four square. The door is four square. Most holy place is four square, 10 by 10, remember? Uh, breastplate on the high priest was four square. Uh, one of the most significant things, I think, is in Revelation chapter 21 22. Remember the bride, the lamb's wife, the New Jerusalem is a city four square, which concludes the book. Begin with the tabernacle of Moses, and end with the city in Revelation. Four square speaks of the, the message of the brazen altar, which is atonement or the blood sacrifice. Again, being a four, and we've covered this before, a worldwide message that's to be taken everywhere. It's the power of God and the salvation, Romans 1, 16. It 
It speaks of the fullness of Ephesians, chapter 4, 11 through 16, till we get to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And of course, you do that by submitting to those five ministries whose purpose is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we come into the unity of the faith. The altar was hollow. Except the grate was in the middle, but it was open at the top, open at the bottom. Speaks of an open heaven. Also speaks of Jesus emptying himself. Philippians 2, 6 through 7, or Philippians 2, verse 7. Made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. Exodus 27 and verse 2. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Here's the horns. They're a little different in different drawings. They point up and out. Up and out. Up, resurrection, upreach to God. Out, outreach to man. Outward. Cross was the same way. Up to God and out to man. Horizontal and vertical. Horns speak of power and strength. Uh, won't go to the scriptures, but Psalms 92 and 10, Psalms 132 and 17. Uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 67 through 75 talk about Jesus being raised up and horn of salvation. A couple of scriptures I found were kind of interesting. Second Samuel 22 and verse 3 says, The God of my rock... In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. My high tower and my refuge, my Savior, thou savest me from violence. Then the psalmist took it in Psalms 18.2 and said, The Lord is my rock. Second Samuel said, The God of my rock. Psalms 18.2 said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So we see Jesus in the horns there the strength and the power in the animal. It also represented uh, the strength and the power. Uh, there's a lot of places in uh, throughout the Bible that the horn's spoken of. Uh, in Genesis chapter 22 and 13, you find the ram of substitution. Remember, uh, Abraham took Isaac up to sacrifice him, and, and the ram was caught in the thicket by the horns. Uh, Israel blew the ram's horn at the fall of Jericho in Joshua chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 5 and 6, Christ is seen as a lamb with seven horns. Seven mean the number of completion or maturity, so there's perfect strength or strength in maturity. You also find in Daniel chapter 7 and 8 in Revelation chapter 13, the horns being symbolic of the beast kingdom and the power of it. 1 Samuel 16, 13, horns were used to hold an anointing oil. So they talk about, it speaks of anointing. The horns of the altar, Psalms 118 and verse 27 says, Bind the sacrifice with cords even into the horns of the altar. And uh, that seems to indicate that they tied some of the sacrifices to the, horn, to the horns of the altar to keep them there. They weren't willing sacrifices. However, Jesus, of course, was. He was bound there by cords of love. Uh, just like the nails didn't hold him to the cross, it was love that held him to the cross. Because in Matthew chapter 26, 53, he said he could have called 12 legions of angels at any time and come down from the cross, so it wasn't the nails holding him on there. It was purpose that held him there. Love. The horns are the horns of the altar. There's two particular passages of Scripture, and I won't go into detail on them, but 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 50 through 53 talks about Adonijah uh, who was caught hold on the horns of the altar and, and found refuge there from Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 28 through 34. Uh, Joab, on the other hand, who was rebellious, caught hold of the horns of the altar and died there. Death to one, life to the other. Uh, certainly 1 Corinthians 1.18 exemplifies that. It says, For the preaching of the cross, or the brazen altar, it's to them that perish foolishness. But unto 
us which are saved is the power of God. Second Corinthians chapter 2, 14 and 16 says, To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. So the cross speaks life to some and death to others, and it's a death to us anyway, death to self. Power in the blood. In Leviticus chapter 4, verses 25 through 26, you'll find that when they did the sin offering, they took the blood from the sacrifice, put it on the horns of the altar, the brazen altar. You also find in Ezekiel chapter 43 the same thing in verse 20. Took the blood and put it on the four horns of the altar. Now, these four horns can also speak of four different things that were accomplished at the cross because that's where the, the strength and the power of the cross, what came out of it. Number one is redemption. What is redemption? Webster says, to redeem means to buy back, repurchase, to free from what distresses or harms, to free from captivity by payment of ransom, to extricate from or help to overcome something detrimental, to release from debt, to free from the consequences of sin, to atone for. So let's look at a few of these things that uh, when we're talking about redemption that happens at the cross. Well, what, what time you got, Robert? Okay, I'll read these. That'll take too long to go through them. Ephesians 1, 7 says, whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Again, a grace, number five, all the way through it. And blood, redemption, price is paid. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9.15, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 26. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, you know, I want to... God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past. Anytime you, ha you know, mess up from sin, the Bible also says we'll confess our sins, his faith and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And by so doing, every time you do that, that's, a, that's another sacrifice in a sense. That's another application of the blood. And that's another covering of all those past sins. From that moment, everything you've done before that is cleaned off. Actually, everything you do from then on is cleaned off too. But uh, all the sins are covered. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. Revelation 5 and verse 9, Redeemed us. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Again, the blood, the sacrifice, redemption. Price is paid. Second thing it is, Ransom. Ransom, Webster says, is a consideration paid or demanded for the redemption of a captured person. Redemption is the act. Ransom is the price. He redeemed us. And he was the price. He was the ransom. Matthew twenty twenty eight. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister 
and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So he's the ransom. He's the price that was paid for our redemption. He was our substitution, third thing. And there's endless and countless scriptures you could put here. Romans 5 and 8, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 32, delivered him up for us all. He that, this is one of my favorite scriptures. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Again, we have the three feasts. That's the first one, Passover. The blood on the doorpost. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Galatians 3.13, Made a curse for us. This is the things he substituted for. Ephesians 5.2, Giving himself for us. Titus 2.14, Gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. 1 Peter 2.21, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 1 Peter 4, 1, Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. And of course, 1 John 3, 16 sums it all up. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He's the one... Fell on the ground and died, and you got to fall on the ground and die too, or you bite alone. Fourth thing, reconciliation. See, so sin passed on all men through Adam. So the wage of sin is death, so the only thing you could get is death. He came as a substitution, died in your place. Take that away. Took away your sins. Became a substitute. Became sin. And redeemed us. He was the ransom. And by so doing, there was a reconciliation. Webster says rec reconciliation is this. To restore to friendship or harmony. Settle. Resolve. To make consistent or congruous. To cause, to submit to, or accept. The best one I like is to restore friendship or harmony. So there's an image between God and man through sin. God couldn't have a relationship with us because of sin. Reconciliation means restoring that relationship. And his sacrifice, one of these horns, is indicative of the fact that he reconciled us or put us back, back in standing with God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 or verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And that's what we talk about a lot of times. Some religions are out there like God's got a hammer waiting on you to mess up so he can hit you in the head. Or you can live 100 years and never sin and mess up two seconds before your last breath and go to hell. You know? That's not the ministry of reconciliation. <laughs> that's a hammer ministry. <laughs> and he's given us the same ministry he had. And that's just to go out and tell everybody, hey, God ain't mad at you. Your sin's been covered. Everything's been taken care of by his blood. Everything. I mean everything. There's some stout scriptures we've read here tonight. Sin doesn't, ha doesn't have any dominion over you. Iniquity's covered. Curse is taken away. No more death. No more sickness. No more disease. No more poverty. No more anything. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 through 18 Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 
That's the thing Satan beats you over the head with is your sins. You know what you done yesterday, Sandy. You know, God's mad at you. And he's not. He made it right with God for the sins of the people. Wherein that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able also to succor them that are tempted. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 through 19. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. God's your friend. I mean, think about your kids. You want to go around loving them, doing good things for them all the time? You want to go around slapping them, knocking them upside the head, and hitting them with sticks? Now, don't answer that, some of you. <laughs> all those were sticks in your hands. <laughs> Uh, God loves us more than we love our kids. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 through 22. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. See, God don't even look at you. He just looks at Jesus. He just looks at the blood. So no matter how bad you may think you are or how bad Satan beats you over the head with how bad you are, it's covered. God don't even look at you that way. Yeah. Romans 5.10 says For if then we were enemies We were reconciled to God By the death of his son Much more being reconciled We shall be saved by his life uh, A word used in conjunction with reconcile Or reconciliation would be propitiation Which means to gain or regain The favor or goodwill of God in Romans chapter 3, it said, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith, talking about Jesus. First John chapter 2 and verse 2, And he is the propitiation, or the appeasement, or the uh, propitiation for our sins. First John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And these scriptures just carry right on forth. Every time he starts talking about everything he done at the cross, he starts telling us we ought to do it. Lay down your life for the brother. Here, we ought to love one another. And it carries over to us. Exodus 27, 2 says, Overlay it with brass. And we've talked about brass being judgment. Uh, God's judgment. On the, at the cross, judgment on sin. Uh, another thing that points and directs the fact that the, the brazen altar is representative and typifies the cross. Uh, you, you probably recall in Numbers chapter 21, verse 6 through 9, you remember when the, uh, the children of Israel were disobedient and the snakes came and were deadly and were biting them and uh, God told Moses, in verse 9, and, Mo and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And that was God's deliverance was serpent on the, bra the brass serpent on the pole. And then John chapter 3, verse 14 talks about that. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that ties it 
together over here with a cross with a serpent on it. And of course, the serpent speaks of sin, and he became sin for us on the, on the pole. And, of course, brought deliverance to us just as the serpent on the pole brought deliverance to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin. Of course, who knew no sin? And put him on the pole. Brass. Brass pole. And there you got brass and wood tied together because you got the cross and the pole. There's one thing that, that I'll just throw out here that it's kind of interesting. Um, in Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 40, you'll find this. Remember when they made brass uh, censers and were making incense? I think it was 250 uh, princes of the assembly that uh, uh, rebelled against Moses and Aaron. And they took their brass censers and melted them down and made a covering for the brazen altar. And in verse... 38, it says, The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the, they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hollowed, and they shall be a sign of the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers, when they that were burnt had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger was not of the seed of Aaron, Come near to offer incense before the Lord, that it be not as Korah and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. They melted down their brass censers and made a covering for the brazen altar. Uh, Exodus 27, 3, real quick. Thou shalt make his pans. It's kind of interesting he calls this brazen altar his. His pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins his flesh hooks and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. So there was five, again, brass uh, instruments or tools here used in connection with the brazen altar. Uh, the pans there were for carrying the ashes. You know, you burnt the sacrifice on the top of it and, and uh, the ashes came down through the grate there. Put some fire on it. You know something else about this? this? This never went out. They had to keep this thing going all the time. They had to go out and get wood, and they had certain people that that's what their chore was, to wood haulers, I guess, go out and get the wood to burn under here. And you remember I talked about one thing that the wood speaks of is the human nature, and it's burnt here. And you can't have a sacrifice without your, your human nature being the thing that burns. And, you know, you think about some of these symbols, you know, like the winds, the spirit, you can't have a fire without that. God is a f consuming fire. He consumes a sacrifice. His ministers are a flame of fire. You can't uh, see a fire unless you see its flames. And, and, and the, fl the fire is manifested through the flames or through the ministries. So you've got them down here in conjunction with the fire. It's the Holy Spirit being the wind. And your human nature burning up. As it's consumed. There's ashes left. And as it consumes, it also burns the sacrifice. In other words, if you're going to praise God... You're going to have to give up your time for what you want to do to dedicate it to praising Him. If you want to give Him thanksgiving, remember the sacrifice, thanksgiving, praise we talked about earlier. If you want to be thanking Him, thanking Him, uh, that's going to take what we call time, which means it's time you could be doing something you want to do, or your flesh wants to do, or you know, you could be fishing and hunting instead of praising and thanksgiving. Nothing wrong with fishing and hunting, though. <laughs> Lest I be put upon the brazen altar and burnt by the fishermen and the hunters. <laughs> and I got to think about this, too. It talks about, you know, uh, being a sweet savor, some of these offerings here, the burnt off the meal, offering the peace offering that would burn on here, which are oxen, lamb, sheep, things of this nature. I ain't never smelled nothing burn that smelt good to me, but what's repugnant to men is pleasing to God. You know, men may look on you when you're, uh, you spend an hour or two praying a day? Wow, what a waste of time. Remember that song I wrote, Mama's Prayer? You know, I used to think it was a waste of time. Now I understand what, why she was doing it. 
The pans were for carrying the ashes that came down through here. They had a place outside the camp, a clean place that they uh, took the ashes, and the pans were for that. They had the shovels. The shovels were for picking up the ashes and putting them in the pans. Pretending to the fires, they were also used to take the coals. The coals were taken, and this connects it with the golden altar of incense back here, where you have prayer, praise, and worship also, right before the veil, where they took the incense. You can't have the incense unless you've got some heat under there from those coals, and those coals came from out here. And they took the shovel, put it in, and uh, carried it in there to the golden altar of incense. And for doing that, they also had the fire pans. The fire pans were for carrying the uh, hot coals. Shovels get them out. Shovels also get the ashes out. The basins were used to put the blood off the altar sacrifice. Remember when they carried the blood, anointed different things, like on the Day of Atonement when they went in and sprinkled it in the, on the Ark of the Covenant once a year. The flesh hooks, they were used to uh, put the pieces of meat on the, you know, the sacrifice, put them in order on the... Uh, on the brazen altar. They're also used for the priest to take their portion. The graded network in the midst, of course again speaks of Jesus who was in the midst uh, in the three crosses uh, between the two thieves. It also speaks of this crucifixion being an inward working in the midst and inside. Uh, the grate was, a, like I said, in the midst, which this was three cubits tall. So it was one and a half cubits up, which is the same height as the Ark of the Covenant. So it connects it to there. It's also the same height as the table of the shoe bread. Uh, so there you have judgment and mercy connected from judgment seat to the mercy seat beginning to the end and then of course Passover and the feast in the table of shoe bread the staves again represent a balance not only what Jesus did and what we've got to do but also in balancing death and resurrection because with death, you can't just have people want to stay at the cross and never leave and grow up. Uh, and there's two dangers you got to watch. And one of them is staying at the cross and never growing up. And that's all you know, what Jesus did for me. And never knowing what i got to do for my brother, brethren and for him. And then there's leaving the cross and forgetting about it. Forgetting what he did for you. And forgetting what you got to do. And a balanced message of death and resurrection. Again, again, you know, and to me that's one of the most prevalent uh, problems in the past in the church has been being out of balance on that one part right there of being legalism or license. Jesus did so much for me, man, I've got a license, I can do anything I want. All my sins are covered. I can just go sin all I want because it's covered. So I've got a license to sin. Nah. I gotta take off my girl's bug, I gotta die. <laughs> Taking that to one extreme, and then you got legalism, you know. Short sleeve shirts, you go to hell. Women with pants, go to hell. You see, that's the extremes that the church is taking it though. License to do whatever you want and then put you in bondage with legalism. Preaching one 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 sh one stave of the altar or the other. <laughs> and you know what happens when you do that? just picked up one side it's going to tip over and the sacrifice is going to fall off but you can't sacrifice with it lopsided out of balance we'll cover some more on this I, I, this is touching the surface and I apologize for reading so many scriptures but the Bible just kind of speaks for itself on, the, on what I mean it just connects itself to the praise and altar so vividly through the blood the cross the wood the brass everything the horns it was the horn of our salvation there's horns there. The only other place there's horns is on the golden altar of incense. And we'll stop there for tonight. That's probably been about an hour or so. And uh, if you got tears, they're over there. <laughs>
Depends on the offering, I think. Like, yeah, uh, the burn offering, for example, uh, Leviticus chapter 1 showed you three different types of offerings you can bring. Uh, 